Hey, welcome back everybody to Grab Back. Now I'm saying welcome back because I'm actually recording in the very same day this lesson as I recorded last week's. <laughs> so I did the game show thing, you know, where you take different clothes and you just change your shirt, make people think that it's a different episode kind of. Well, anyway, who cares really? <laughs> So we're, this is Grab Bag uh, Series 3, Episode 2, and, uh, you know, this is going to be released, let's see, I guess it would be January 17th, but like I said, this is the same day of recording as last week's lesson, which means that right now it's only January 4th. So people are still saying Happy New Year to different people, and I just want you to know that I don't wish people Happy New Year. I mean, every once in a while it might slip out because it's been 60 some years of habit. But I try not to wish people Happy New Year because happiness is a fleeting feeling that's based on an emotional reaction to circumstances. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Mr. Rob Freud. But, but anyway, I, I decided to express my hopes to you to have a joyful, a joy-filled 2021 rather than a happy new year. Sure, I hope that you are happy more so than not. But the thing is, joy runs deeper within. Even when the bluebird of happiness has flown to the nether regions for a short or a long while. And therefore, I hope you each have a joyful new year. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The strength of the Lord is your joy. The American Constitution states that we are uh, given the right to pursue happiness. It doesn't give us a promise that we'll ever catch it. Uh, because catching happy, uh, that's difficult. But yet, you see a lot of people who every day are on the hunt for happy they're tracking happiness and attempting to capture it. But even if they do catch it, they think they have, it can't be held captive for very long. But joy, someone defined joy as Jesus, others, and you in that priority order. Joy is not something we can catch. Joy is something that captures us and breathes into us life and hope, even when the storms hit us. And so that is why, my friends, I pray for you a joyful, joy-filled year to come. So if you would hit the button down on the bottom to give us an idea that you're uh, spending a little bit of time with us, if you'll do that, I'd appreciate that very, very much. And it may seem contradictory for this time of the new year to speak about death, <laughs> but that is exactly what I want to mention and talk to you about in this second episode of Grab Bag Series 3. You know, I have been encouraged to limit the duration of my lessons. And I imagine there are some people who say, oh, he just talks too much and I just don't have the time. And I'm sorry about that. Um, being less long-winded will be a resolution for me this year. However, I might have trouble keeping that resolution. So I'm using a cheat sheet to keep myself on track and I'm speaking as fast as I can. The problem is when I talk very fast, my tongue gets tangled and uh, then mistakes happen, but they happen and on we go. So here, here's my problem is my problem is that I love studying the scripture and I love sharing some gems of wisdom the Lord leads me to uncover. Years ago, there was a Bible that was labeled the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And the idea behind that Bible was based on the truth that Scripture teaches Scripture. The Word of God is so awesomely written, as you might expect, when it's led and directed by an awesome God, that like links in a chain, one Scripture leads to another scripture, which leads to another, and so forth, and so forth. And so therefore, by following the links in the chain, one could study scripture from one kiver to kiver, as they say, from one cover to the other cover, and allow the word to teach through itself. 
So when I study scripture, I'm jazzed by how one topic, one doctrine, even one word will open the door to another and to another and to another. And it, it's like, like a maze, but the good kind of maze that leads to a prize because doors keep opening. And I, I get excited about and I want to share each Bible discovery that builds on another. But then what happens is I get too much material and <coughs> man, excuse me. Wow. Mm. I'm sorry about that. I get too much material and that makes the videos too long. So my excitement carries me away. So I'm, I'm sorry, I guess. And here I am making this video longer by telling you about how I'm going to make it shorter and why I make the other. Oh, my goodness, Rob, you just drives me crazy. So in the very first grab bag series, I told the class that I would shoot for a 45 minute class, which was the usual length of an on site Bible discovery class. How many times can you use the word class in one sentence? But I will seriously do my best. I, I will seriously do my best to cut back even more. Uh, the attention spans of moderns is much shorter than the attention spans of disciples in days past. So thank you, sound bites, advertisements, and video games for that modern low standard. <laughs> I said I wanted to speak about death, but the truth is I really want to speak about eternal life. You see, less than a week ago, I conducted a funeral for a friend and thoughts not about death, but about eternal life have been sitting prominently uh, on my gray matter. A friend of mine by the name of David Faust wrote that we have strange ways of expressing death. And this is kind of funny. Dave wrote, she kicked the bucket. So does that mean they died of a toe injury or he bought the farm and what died of an uh, acute case of buyer's remorse? She expired like, like, like a parking meter or old milk or he croaked from what? Eating too many frog legs. I remember a joke about a grandchild crawling up into the lap of his grandfather and asking his grandfather to make the sound of a frog to imitate Kermit. And the old man asked the child why, to which the child replied, because when I asked mom about going to Disney World, she said that that wouldn't happen until your grandfather croaks. <laughs> oh my, how harsh, how, how harsh. The Bible uses particular phrases, however, when speaking about death. Genesis 25, eight records, the death of Abraham like this. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. He was gathered to his people. Mr. Faust mentions that those words make death seem less lonely and more like a family reunion. And I would have to agree. The Bible records the death of King David with these words. He rested with his fathers. And again, those are comforting words. David, of course, was the psalmist who wrote, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Death to David was just a relocation to another residence, one that was owned by the Lord. Now, one term that's not used in the Bible in reference to the deaths of Christians is the euphemism passed away. In our day, I guess, I guess because people don't like the reality of the phrase, so-and-so died. You know, they, they, maybe they think it's just too harsh. <laughs> and so they choose a phrase that seems more user-friendly. He or she passed away. But in the scripture, the words passed away mean to go out of existence, to disappear. And the Bible totally disagrees with that idea of death being the end of existence. In fact, for Christians, Scripture states, the world and its desires pass away, they disappear, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. The one who does the will of God does not cease to exist, does not pass away. The one who does the will of God lives forever, and that's 
good news. Passed away doesn't deliver good news. Now, I want to go on record here as not discounting the sincerity of those who offer sympathy for saying so-and-so passed away. Um, perhaps, though, there is a better alternative wording. When I speak of family members, my own family members who died or of Christians who die, I use the terms went to be with the Lord, went home to the Lord, or went to heaven, or he or she joined family members in heaven with the Lord. Why do I use those phrases? Well, yes, because as Christians, they did not pass away, but also because it provided an opportunity or it provides an opportunity to speak well of these people's faith while simultaneously at the same time speaking well of God and his faithfulness to provide a home for his children for forever. It's good to bring God into our conversations, especially with non-believers. And saying that so-and-so passed away doesn't do that. But to say they went to be with the Lord. It speaks of their faith but it also speaks highly of the Lord and brings him into the conversation. I don't know why in our society we're so afraid to speak about death and dying, if we are. I mean, we can't sanitize suffering and death out of life. Death is, as they say, a part of life. It seems oxymoronish, but it's true. Death is a part of life. And it always will be until Jesus returns. For the Christian, however, death is a gift. What? What did you just say? Yeah. Death is a gift. And now we don't have time to unpack that entire thought. But very quickly, let me have you think about not having death as an escape from the sin and suffering of this world through a door into heaven. What if you were locked into this time-space suffering world forever? And I believe that that is why God set an angel to guard the tree of life as recorded in the book of Genesis. After Adam and Eve sinned, God set an angel to guard the tree of life. God in love kept men from eating of that tree that would condemn them to an eternity in this sinful world with its suffering and with its death. Death provides freedom for, well, actually, I have to rethink that. If they had eaten of the tree of life, there would be no death. They would be locked into this world of sin and suffering with no way of escape. You see, death provides freedom for those who trust Christ. That tree of life, by the way, is mentioned as growing in heaven, bearing fruit and serving as a source of healing in eternity. And that is where the tree is most beneficial. You'll find that in Revelation 22, verses 1 through 3. But back to my point. Death is an escape from this world of sin and suffering for the Christian. There is birth and there is death, not passing away. On tombstones, there are dates of birth and dates of death. When someone dies, an authority will fill out a certificate of death, not a certificate of passing away. Death is an enemy. But for the Christian, it's not an enemy to be feared or waltzed around with poetic language. The world tries to avoid looking death in the eye because it has no solution or hope to death. But you and I are different than the world because of Jesus. So if you use the verbiage of passed away, I'm not saying you are wrong. 
I'm just simply saying you may you may have passed up an opportunity to speak for Jesus by simply stating that someone died and went to be with Jesus. And if you say to someone who's a Christian, they went to be with the Lord, they, in, they went home to heaven. It affirms that truth in the heart and mind of the person to whom you are speaking, that Christian. So I would ask one favor. If you use the phrase passed away, please include the word away. Don't say that someone passed. Now that sounds really odd. John passed. Well, yeah, but which direction and how fast was he going? It, it just, it's just weird. Okay, moving on. In the book of Revelation, we read, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest in the Lord, for their deeds will follow them. And so I just want to mention three truths that we can extract from this verse. First of all, did you notice that for those who die in the Lord, death is a blessed event, a blessing, a blessing? Yeah, blessed are those who die in the Lord. They're going on to something better. Death is not an eternal bummer of an ending for those who walk with God. It's like an arduous climb on a blistering hot day that concludes at a cold mountain fountain of crystal clear drinking water. It's like walking all day and then going with friends to an ice cream shop and hearing that the menu item you chose is free of charge. <laughs> you are blessed. A second thing this verse tells us is that those who die in the Lord rest in the Lord. It says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest in the Lord. Now, we have all seen the initials RIP, right? Rest in peace. Well, those who die in the Lord truly do rest in peace. They live in the house built by the Prince of Peace. Struggles, troubles, unrest, war, sorrow, distress, and, and go ahead, add some negative words, you know, that you can think of. The Bible says that for the one who dies in the Lord, all of that stuff is past. No more labor to survive, even. Nope, this is eternal rest. Now, the third thing the scripture tells us is that those who die in the Lord in the Lord will have their deeds follow them. And here is what I think that means. The deeds we do in the flesh, good or bad, well, well they don't precede us in the heaven. The Bible says they follow us. They follow after us. Because heaven is not attained on a works basis. Good deeds follow after those who already, by the work of Christ on the cross, by the gift of God's grace, have entered into God's rest to receive life new and fresh, being more alive than ever before. And their good works follow behind them as a commendation for the work the believer did for Christ and as a commendation for the work Christ did in the believer. Did you get that? Good works follow behind as a commendation for the work the believer did for Christ and as a commendation for the work Christ did in the believer, the work Christ did for the believer. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest in the Lord for their deeds will follow them. You know, when we think of rest, we think probably of sleep. So listen to this description of death that's found in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, at you and me, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. 
there is a difference between the grief of people who think other people pass away and the grief of people who know that the one who does the will of God lives forever. Pass away or grieve, but they don't, they, they don't have any hope. They don't have hope because their loved one or friend passed away. And to them, they no longer exist. They have no assurance of eternal life. He or she is gone from them forever. But for Christian people, God has a core, or, yeah, God. Grief has a core of hope with the promise of reunion. Their Christian loved ones, according to scripture, simply fell asleep in death. And they woke in eternity in the presence of the Savior who died to provide the eternal life in which they are resting in heaven. For that reason, the Bible states, you, believers, do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Because believers have hope that death is not the end. That there's more, and there's better, and there's eternal. For the Christian, physical death is simply a sleep between life and life, between this life and better life. I, I kind of look at it like a snap net, <laughs> you know, because the Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Just a blink of the eye. If that, out with the old earthly breath and in with the new celestial breath, eternal air. And another, another exciting truth is that when believers remaining behind those who died in the Lord one day also fall asleep in death, then they too will awaken to a reunion with their loved one who have gone before them. They'll awake in a home where they will never, never, ever again hear the word goodbye. Never. I, that's a word I don't think that exists in heaven. And then one day, I'll cross that river. And I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he Because he lives, we can face a tomorrow that goes into eternity. One day, my friends, I too will cross death's river. And when I do, please, please do not say, Rob passed away. <laughs> no, you boldly tell whomever will listen that I was gathered to my people that I'm resting with my fathers, both literal fathers and fathers in the faith. Tell them that I went home to a place that I'd never been before, a home not built by earthly hands, but a custom designed home built from the heart and the hands of one who was once a carpenter on earth. Don't tell them that I passed away Tell them honestly that I died in the Lord. Yes, stone cold dead, but that I stepped into life in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the glories of heaven. When I die, tell people that I just fell asleep in death, but I woke in the arms of Jesus. And then tell them one more thing, will you? Tell them that if they trust in the Savior, Jesus Christ, 
then they too can one day join me and all of the faithful. And together we can cross the word goodbye from our vocabulary. Oh. <laughs> My friends, that is hope. Have a joyful 2021.